Aloha and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Got Your Six podcast. This six-question podcast brings together high performers to share their methods, strategies, and ideas delivered in an informative and, most importantly, actionable way that will help you lead yourself and those around you from the battlefield to the boardroom. Coming to you every episode, I'm your host, Tony Nash. And into the breach. Nothing mentioned on this podcast is an endorsement or opinion of the Department of Defense. I got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. I got your six. Sixers, I usually say we have a treat for an episode, but this one's super special because for the first time in the history of the Got Your Six podcast, we have a returning guest, Mike Irwin, founder, executive director of Team Red, White, and Blue, Team RWB. You've seen them everywhere. And that's for a great reason. Mike, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, great to be back. And yeah, what an honor. First uh, repeat customer. I wouldn't have it any other way. Mike, you just released what I think is one of the most pivotal books to come out of the COVID era. um, And really something that's been needed for a while. Leadership is a relationship. Looking at how, as we continue to move into these digital platforms and digital universes, why face-to-face connection and personal connection is so monumental. And I really want to go into this with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, one of the things that's interesting is that this actually started, Tony, way back uh, in 2010. The research, I wrote a paper when I was in grad school um, called Leadership as a Relationship um, way back then. So this is something I've been obsessed by and thinking about really for the past, you know, 11, 12 years. And just, that's... I didn't know that. And then to take that now where we went in, you know, COVID March of 2020 and to see how everything's kind of expedited across the board, right? The, the metaverse and all this other stuff that, that has been working for a while that people thought were five, 10 years down the road is more closer to like two, three years down the road now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we really have to understand, you know, and prioritize the well being of other people as we continue to lead, not only our, them, but ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it is, um, you know, it is a very timely topic. So the way I describe it as when you read the first book I co-author called Lead Yourself First, we really define the information age as having started in about 2005. And a lot of things allow us to define that, but it's, you know, the return of the, the dot-com burst. Uh, it was, you know, the beginning of apps, social media platforms becoming a thing, smartphones, uh, like the, it was the BlackBerry back then. There wasn't the first iPhone yet, right? But that was the, the advent of uh, the information age. And you, and you look at that, uh, it, had a, a, as, it had a profound impact on how we live our lives. And, you know, in the first book, we talked about, well, how has that affected our ability to do three big things? Think hard, focus, and reflect. And those things really have become significantly harder and require a lot of intentionality to make them a priority in the world today. Um, This next book really explores, well, what has been the impact of technology and all the noise and everything going on uh, in the information age, the impact on relationships? And the thing is, we started to write this book long before COVID hit, but what we've seen is that Uh, COVID, really March 2020 and beyond, has only added uh, boatloads of fuel to the fire. Uh, It has accelerated the pace of a digital first world. Uh, It has made lots of organizations go to first because they had to, and now by choice uh, or by quasi-choice, they've moved to a digital slash virtual remote first world. Um, And the big question here when it comes to leadership, as the book describes in its title, is Well, how do we build camaraderie with? How do we connect with? How do we forge relationships with the people that we lead, people who lead us, and then the people to our left and our right and our team? And I think that, to me, is the fundamental question that we're trying to push in this book and trying to assert is the belief that while a leader has a lot of responsibilities in delivering outcomes, be they wins, uh, test scores, profits, readiness, uh, whatever it might be, while those are important, that part of the path, a very important part, you know, of the path involves humanity and it involves building strong relationships with those people that you work with. Um, and it's gotten a lot harder to do, much like it's gotten harder to focus, think and reflect. It's gotten harder to build strong and meaningful relationships. Um, and as we look towards the future, uh, that challenge does not look to be slowing down one bit. 
Right. And inside the book, there's a lot of different strategies from, <laughs> you know, across the board. You have Olympic athletes, um, mo- large business owner, like CEOs of companies, small business owners. Like it really takes a lot of different careers and backgrounds and skill sets. And the school of thought of, you know, leadership is a relationship and looking at how to implement this. So it's not just a one size fits all. It, it's very specific, yeah. but the, the messages, you know, go across really whatever domain yeah. you find yourself in. And I, and I should start off by saying on that note, 100%, I would, I would add to that. One of the things that we've tried to do in this book as well, and if you've ever been in one of my leadership seminars or heard me talk about this before, I really believe in making leadership accessible. What do I mean by that? I mean that leadership with a capital L, right, might be you have a certain number of people that you're in charge of and you have this budgets and these responsibilities. Um, but leadership with the little L is arguably just as important. And in many cases, it might be more important. And that is, it doesn't have anything to do with rank or title or position or budget or direct reports. It has to do with how you influence the people around you to do the right thing, to do what needs to be done. And so ironically, the definition that we leverage around leadership comes from what Jim Collins assessed uh, when I was you know, working with him at West Point, when I had the honor of being like his general's aide, he assessed it to be the best definition of leadership that he could come up, that he had come across in all of his years studying leadership. And it comes from General slash President Eisenhower, all right, a proud graduate, class of 1915, the United States Military Academy. Leadership is the art of getting other people to do what needs to be done because they want to do it, right? It's not in there. Anything in there is, is there saying something that you need to be officially uh, or codified to be in charge of people. No, leadership is getting other people to do what needs to be done. And then that, that last part, because they want to do it. Well, how do you help people want to do something? Well, the number one way in my book is that I don't want to let someone down. If I got a relationship with one of my leaders and I don't want to let him or her down, then I'm going to want to do whatever that task is, whether or not I actually want to do it or not. Right. So again, coming out of the gates, I just want to highlight that and really define leadership as I don't want to be too new agey here. Right. Be like, oh, everyone's a leader. Like, but no, it, but everyone has the potential and the capacity to lead depending on the environment they find themselves in. Right. And to your, to that point, it's not just a professional relationship. It's also personal relationships, right? Like my wife tells me all the time, I want you to want to do the dishes. Um, yeah. and, and it's not the dishes per se, but it's contributing to, you know, the team, right? How, how can we contribute, not let another person down, continuing to move along towards that vision that we all share and that shared purpose we have. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think there's, you know, again, why is that important as as it pertains to this book? Uh, Because a big part of what we wanted to do was make uh, this conversation uh, more accessible to people and not think that this is, uh, you must be like a manager or a leader of X number of people before this book applies to you. This is really a life book. This is a book about life. Um, Because guess what? Uh, Leadership is in our families. Leadership is in our volunteer organizations. It's in our neighborhoods. Uh, it's in uh, our, our jobs, obviously. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere you look. There are opportunities for leadership, and especially in the virtual world, right? We have these people that we call thought leaders, right? The, the Susan Cains and Simon Sinek's and Brene Browns of the world who, who shape the way people think. Well, we don't just call them thinkers. But we now call them thought leaders. Um, so ultimately, like this concept of making leadership more accessible is very important because I think often, if I'm being honest, I think a lot of people might use it as a bit of a crutch and be like, well, I'm not, I'm not the one in charge here. I'm not the leader, so it's not my fault. Uh, and that's a very disempowering sort of view. I, I'm a big believer in, in empowering as many people as possible to see their capacity to lead, right? Depending on the environment that they're in, they might very well be the best person situated to lead, whether or not they have the formal authority or, or power to do it or not. Right. And you see this in, in real life, IRL, uh, as they say with all your work you do at the high school, right? Um, mm-hmm. Every week where you're, where you're building, you're creating adversity for the team to come together. And I really want you to talk about that for the team to come together um, through shared hardship. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so I'm uh, I, one of the, the, the hats that I wear is I'm the uh, chairman of the board and one of the founders of a private independent Catholic high school outside Fort Bragg uh, called Father Vincent Capadano High. And uh, every Wednesday, uh, that I'm not on the road, 
uh, which is most you know, most of the time I'm, I'm here on Wednesdays. I, I teach the Character Leadership and Resilience course, and it's heavy on uh, uh, you know, experiential learning. And we spend a lot of time really putting the students in, in not too dissimilar to like the military environment, challenging situations where they have to work together. It's hard. They have to communicate effectively. Uh, and what you see is that, yes, there are certain people who are in charge, quote unquote, like they're the upperclassmen, the seniors. Um, but often when you get into an environment where they're, uh, you know, they're back on their heels a little bit, they're not doing so well, they're not having a great day. You'll often see someone who's younger step up into that leadership role and say, okay, hey, here's what we're going to do. I need you doing that. I need you doing that. Right. And so one of the great things about adversity uh, is that it sets the conditions to show people in the moment, right, just how important it is for somebody to step up and lead. And that somebody does not have to be like the named, the quote unquote named leader. It might very well be someone who just in the moment sees the answer, knows what needs to be done, steps up and guides the team to do it. And I love seeing when, when that happens. I do too. When you when you post about it, it's so cool to watch because I, I we've all we've all been in those predicaments where you have to like you know move a truck and one of the tires is gone or you know <laughs> yeah. something like that. Um, so with this tyranny of distance that's now presented, you know, in the virtual world, whether it be in the metaverse or you know a Zoom call and trying to do a remote team, how do people then build those relationships? Yeah. That's, 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 that's the billion dollar question right now. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you, you know, one of the things I've talked to people before about, you know, uh, empathy, right? Like, so how do you, how do you show empathy for people? Um, especially when they're going through ups and downs and all that. Uh, and, and one, a couple of people said to me, like, Hey, I've never met this person in, in person. Like yeah. all I need to do is know them is through like, you know, video chat. Um, and, and just how much harder it is to kind of feel the emotional connection between people when it's over a stream versus when you when you're in the same shared room or shared geographical space. So this is, this is the challenge. Let me back up and say though, what the research shows us when it, when we look at relationships in our personal and professional lives, relationships have been uh, uh, getting harder and harder to build. Um, and, and when you look at the data on this, like the, there's like surveys to get put out, like hey, how many people you know close friends do you have in your life? Um, and the, the median or the mean has fallen. And I want to say it's between like 2007 and 2014, like in less than a decade, 2.94 to 2.06. It's fallen by almost one whole person. Wow. And the interesting thing about that is that the mode, the most common answer is now zero. The most common answer, uh, and this is consistent with the, the data around loneliness and around the struggles that a lot of people have around connection is that that I think it's like 20 plus percent of people answer the question, I don't have a single person in my life that I, like, I, I am very close with and that I could trust in any situation, right? And I'm botching the exact wording in the questions, but sure. like, that's the whole idea. So this was pre-COVID. And the point that I keep trying to make is like that we're in this environment now for the past 21 months and certainly for longer is uh, as, you know, as, as we continue to not come together or not spend time in person or move to a hybrid or a fully remote work environment, um, how are we supposed to do our best work when we don't really feel a connection to the people leading us and to the people that we're rowing with, right? And, and look, you know, I mean, you know, I'm a big optimist, right? Like, so I'm not sitting here and be like, oh, the sky is falling, chicken little. Sure. Like, I, I'm not that guy, but I think it's real, the really important questions to ask ourselves you know, is that there's a lot of people who have been making this move, you know, towards, you know, the, you know, the, the permanent remote environment. Uh, and look, that's how Team Runway Blue has been operating since the very beginning of the staff. So, like, it can be done, but, like, we've addressed these things over the past seven years about how, you know, how to get better and how to do it. Um, but it, it is still very hard, you know. Um, and I'm speaking from firsthand experience about those connections with people. And I feel such a stronger connection to the people on my staff that I've spent a lot of time with in person, whether it be on the Old Glory Relay Trail or in chapter events or at various events in Team Red, White, and Blue history versus those that I've never met, right? Or right. those that I've met in person, like literally one time for one and a half days. Like the, the difference is, is palpable. It's real, you know? Um, and I think that if we don't acknowledge that, I, I think that we're doing a disservice to, uh, to the reality that we face on a, on a given day-to-day uh, um, work environment. 
No, and to that point, right? Technology is supposed to make our life more efficient. That's why it exists. You know, that's why we, we drive instead of, you know, on horseback now and, you know, pick a thing yep. that's been a techno technological advancement. Um, and then we can <laughs> see how it, but in this case, it actually creates more work and self-awareness to understand you need to put in more time with the team with those, not only that, like you said, that you report to, but also those that report to you and the people to your left and right to understand yep. and really ask that because how often is that question asked? Hey, how are you doing today? No, I'm okay. No, no, let's pause real quick. How are you really doing? Mm -hmm. And you really have to like break that fourth wall and get into that person's yep. life. And so they can feel and understand that you're coming from a place of like authenticity and you genuinely care about their emotional, mental, physical states. Yeah, that's exactly right. And just like, you know, with uh, lead, in lead yourself first, like this is within your power to put the phone down, to step away from it, you know, so that you can think, focus, and reflect. It is in your power to make technology work for you. If I had to guess, and, and this is totally just like, um, you know, I guess Kentucky winded here, right? But I would say that about 10% of people have used technology to their advantage to make the relationship stronger. And about 90% of the people have not, right? Um, yeah. And then of course it's, it's a bell curve distribution, I think, and all that. But bottom line is like, it can be done, right? You can use technology uh, in a way to post meaningful pictures, to have an actual strategy about what you put out to people on social media uh, and to what you consume, right? Who you follow, who you listen to, um, right? I, it is possible you know, to make technology and to, and to make social media and all the things of the world today strengthen your relationships. Absolutely. Right. The problem becomes if we're spending, if the average person is spending four or five, six hours a day on screen time, and most of that is being distracted or being entertained uh, or, you know, people fighting for your attention and it's, and it's distracting you from the people right in front of you. And let me be clear, this is, if you're in the same geographical space, be it your family or your friends uh, or your coworkers, or especially for work in a distributed environment, if you're on Zooms and on Teams meetings and you're half paying attention because you're doing your email or you're looking at an article on ESPN.com, you're, you're like, if you don't think that people can tell, I'm, I'm here to let you know yeah, you're wrong. Absolutely. Right? People can tell <laughs> if you're engaged and you know this from your time in the military, but the greatest leaders, at least in my experience, are the ones who, when you're talking to him or her, they make you feel like the only person in the world that matters at that moment. Right. Like in this moment, Absolutely. when I'm talking to you right now, I'm not distracted by my phone or looking at my screen or doing that. But like you feel like, wow, this person makes me feel valued. Right. And, and so when you do that, even in a virtual environment, I do all the time. Like I give people a simple advice, like keep your hands up. Right. I don't keep my hands down here very much because people are like they start assuming. What are you doing? Like, what, you know, are you doing emails right now? Or are you are you going to a website? Are you trying to pull something up on Amazon? Um, Right. So I do things all the time to kind of show people like, no, I'm here. I'm fully present. I'm listening and I'm paying attention. Right. That's relationship building use of technology. Most people, it's the opposite. They have their screen off or if their screen is on very clearly, they're not paying attention. You know, when you're talking, because someone will make a joke and they'll be like deadpan. You're like, dude, like, like someone just made a hilarious Hello? joke. Like, and, and you, yeah. and you totally missed it, you know? So anyway, so right. again, the, the broader point here really is, is just about, humanity and connection. And yes, we can do it through technology, right? We just have to have the discipline. And unfortunately, we all know how much sleep we're supposed to get. We're supposed to eat healthy. We're supposed mm -hmm. to exercise. The hard part is not knowing what we're supposed to do. The hard part is actually following through and doing it. Right. And this was a, a continuation from our previous conversation, right? Separating all that noise from the signal. And that's a great takeaway tip you talked about, like keeping your hands up somewhere in the video or structuring it so yeah. people can see what you're doing. <laughs> because I, I don't know how to text with my toes. Uh, I don't know many people that do, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, that yeah. shows like you're, you care, you're generally engaged and it, it allows a human factor. Otherwise you think you're like, you're talking to like Oz or something. Cause it's just a human head. Um, what other totally. takeaway tips, uh, you know, for, for readers that would go into the book and are looking for like an insight that you constantly go back to that people are maybe didn't realize or come to mm -hmm. realize after reading, you know, going through leadership as a relationship. Yeah. So one of the things we talk about towards the end, so we interview it in the tail end. There's three people that we really kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the operationalizing the book. And we interview Matt Hasselbeck, former quarterback for the Seahawks and 
Packers and Colts and, and Titans. I think ESPN analysts in the NFL. Yep. Uh, ESPN analysts, right? Uh, Apollo Ono, you know, uh, more Olympic medals in the Winter Olympics from than anyone else in U.S. history. And then Coleman Ruiz. Uh, Coleman Coleman is a former uh, SEAL Team Six uh, guy uh, and wrestler from the Naval Academy. We interview these three people, and they all talk about the, you know these different concepts and different ideas. But in that portion of the book. Uh, I suggest 20 questions, and this is by by no means exhaustive, but there's 20 questions that I would recommend uh, that you share with people in your you know uh, on your team, especially if in a remote environment. But uh, but even if not, like with your platoon, with your you know your your squad, whatever it might be, like and these are questions that, that get outside the scope of work. They're simple. They're simple things like uh, you know what's your dream job? Because very few of us are maybe are, are in our dream job, right? Um, right. Where, if you could take a trip anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Um, what's the best vacation you've ever taken and why? And what you find is that often that you, you can find common ground and synergy between people who maybe thought they didn't have a whole lot in common. And it's like, hey, you know what? Your favorite trip you ever uh, that you took, you know, was to, uh, you know, to, to Disney World. Well, me too. I'm, I'm a big Disney guy. Right. Like, you know, and like and you find and now you also you're talking about Epcot Center versus Magic Kingdom and what one's better. And you get into, again, relationship building conversation. Um, but we also talk about, the, again, the power of questions from the sense of and you mentioned this earlier in the podcast. But when you just ask someone, hey, how you doing or how was your day? Um, you, that's that's uh, you know, I don't want to say that's a lazy question, but it, it doesn't require a whole lot of thought. And you often get the quality of the response is proportional to the quality of the question. Absolutely. So you garbage in, more garbage thoughtful, out. Meaningful, totally. Like, so you get more thoughtful questions. Uh, when, when you have more thoughtful questions, you get more thoughtful answers and you actually get to know somebody when you ask them, right? Like, hey, what's the biggest, uh, you know, best memory from your childhood? Man, that's a good one. I don't know. I got to think about that one for a minute, right? You actually get to know people. Um, and look, all this stuff does take time. You can't just sit around there and just like, make talk with people all day long. But as you think about how to you know, work with people, especially over a prolonged period of time, getting to know them beyond their job title and their job description uh, is absolutely essential. No, it, it, phasing out, small talk is great. And it's always, you know, that's part of this relationship building where how did the weekend go? Yes. But getting more <laughs> towards that big talk, like you said, understanding someone's passion, purpose, what virtues do they hold so dear to them that they need to continue to, you know, talk about in their lives that affect how they operate inside of a team. Um, and then also making sure you're comfortable with the silence. Because when you <laughs> ask a big question, people aren't going to have that ready response. You, you, it's mm -hmm. going to be a little uncomfortable because you're forcing both people or however many people are in the conversation to be vulnerable. And yeah. people don't handle silence well. I mean, as we have all the notifications dinging and binging, uh, a million times totally. a day. It's, it's a distraction. People, people, I mean, they, they uh, and I'm, look, I, I don't deal well with the silence. I admit this straight up. Like, you know, anyone would know that I'm being hypocritical if I didn't admit to that. Like, it, it is sometimes really tough to be able to just sit there quietly and just like, right, wait for someone to answer or someone to respond, um, you know, but that is, that is definitely, you know, a, a big piece of this is, you know, uh, again, asking good questions and then having the patience to, to really listen to them because, when you do ask um, bigger questions, perhaps heavier questions with heavier answers, uh, people are rarely likely to just lurch right into it. And, and you know, they might have to go, man, I remember when I would watch Jim Collins do this. Like when someone would ask him like a really tough question, he'd just sit there. It was so, it was so awkward, right? It was like, and he'd do that for 20 seconds. The whole room yeah. would be like, yo, is, is he going to talk? You know, um, but it, it was like, you know, because it, 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 was, it, was it was a that was a sign of that was a good question because it was an easy question. He just jumps right into it, right? Yeah. But if it's one that he wants to be articulate about and think about, right? He spends you know the time really in the moment gathering his thoughts and then organizing them before speaking. So again, it really does come back to this idea of how do we how do we relate to other people um, and, and how do we you know give them the space sometimes to be able to really share that. And like you said, it does take time. And guess what, Bob? We interviewed Bob McDonald, former Secretary of the VA, CEO of Procter and Gamble. He, he makes a fascinating, you know, piece of insight in the book that he shared with us. He's like, look, relationship building, you know, especially from a leadership and a work standpoint, feels inefficient. It feels like, man, instead of like, you know, this hour long dinner, I could be doing something else. I could be getting X number of tasks done, right? right? I could be making more calls, more emails, getting more done. 
that's not the case at all, right? Like when you're sitting there building a relationship, like there's there's no immediate ROI on that. It really is for deep thinkers and people who are long-term thinkers who know that as I build and I forge this relationship, it's going to bear fruit for both of us and for both of our organizations down the road, right? But most people are like, uh, gotta get going, man. Like I, you know, I, I got stuff I gotta do. Right. right. And so there's, there's always that tension there. Yeah, and I think before you use the house analogy, right. It's not like you build the house and then you can go live in it. It's just constant building, tearing down because as you figure out where people's boundaries, what they're comfortable sharing, what they're not comfortable sharing, it's, it's this iterative process as opposed to like, just, you know, set it and forget it. The Ronco, uh, for those that mm-hmm. remember like, the infomercial, um, because yes. it, it's this, it's this constant back and forth. It's very fluid uh, as opposed to just like A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, that's right. You know what? I mean, if you, if you get a chance, you got to pick up the book. Yeah, even if you, you, know, you see it anywhere, just going in there and getting these tips and understanding like next time you meet somebody, maybe you don't ask them their favorite sports teams or what they do for work. And you ask them, you know, like Mike said, What's your, what's your, you know, what's one of your favorite childhood memories and just kind of sit in that silence, get a little uncomfortable. Uh, and you're gonna come out with it, you know, a strength in that relationship going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And that, one of the things that I just would highlight as well, um, you know, is that, and we ripped on this a few weeks ago when we, when we talked Tony, but like, you know, I think that there's a, there's a big, where a lot of people are at this crossroads, you know, in life, I, I feel like there's this crossroads and it started, um, you know, let's say back in their information age, but like, let's say right on 2010, give or take. Um, and, and very few people had the capacity to be able to, well, no one had the capacity, you know, even probably Steve Jobs himself to look into the future and see how much like the iPhone and how the smartphone and Wi-Fi and apps and all those things would fundamentally change the world and, and how we live in it, right? How we communicate, how we get our information, how we shop, how we, get around via I mean, Uber, I mean, 10 years, taxis, Ubers, I mean, it used to be taxis, you had to call someone and wait somewhere, right? Just think about all the ways that technology is, is in many ways made the life, the world more convenient, right? Right. Um, and, and I think there's this, this similar moment that we find ourselves at right now with like all this talk of the metaverse and all this talk of, you know, what does that look like in the future? Well, we already know like the ship has already started to sail with like this metaverse, the idea that your digital self is more important and what you do in that digital world is more important than what you do in real life, right? IRL, right? In yeah. real life. Um, and, and I think we've got quite, we're at crossroads. We, people have got choices to make. And I think you're going to see kind of like a, what is it? The Robert Frost poem, right? And I made the path less travel and it's made all the distance, right? You came to the fork in the road. So again, I don't want to portray it as a binary choice to this or that. Right. Um, but I do think that, um, right, if you, if you go down the road, like lots of people will, like they already have started to go down that road of um, playing connected video games and having friends. I use air quotes because like you're never going to meet the person in real life, yet they're your buddy, you know, on Fortnite or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a fundamentally different emotionally, mentally, physically, every domain, fundamentally different uh, relationship experience than it is to hug someone, to cry with them, to hold their hair when they're puking, um, you know, to, to work late night on a project because a project for work has got to get done by, you know, you know, six o'clock in the morning. Um, that is a fundamentally different experience. And, and I think that if people are not careful, and they go too far down that road, that fork in the road, you know, towards the digital metaverse world. Um, uh, to me, the research points to more uh, challenges around the men- on mental health, more challenges around life satisfaction, um, and, a, and a sense of a hey, there's a lot of entertainment and there's a lot of convenience in my life, right? Uh, but there's not a lot of deep seated joy and in, in fulfillment in my life. Right, I'm getting a little bold here. I guess a little spicy, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. I, 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 I knew. I was hoping we were going to go down this path because I love the heat. Um, yeah. It, it, it is true, right? Like you, just like a diet. And when I say diet, I mean like what you consume. It goes in your body for nutritional value. <laughs> if you if you go and focus just solely on protein, your body's going to shut down. Just like the same with carbs and fat. You need to have a healthy balance and understanding. Yep. 
understanding that balance and knowing those different putting factors in place to kind of pull back out and go back in. Yeah. Because if you just continue to stay addicted, right, that's you're going to get sucked in and the dopamine is what gives you what you think is purpose. And you're constantly tracing that dragon. Um, when sometimes you're just going right. to be like, you know what? I got to unplug and walk away. And you talk about that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then just, you know, kind of putting a bow on the thought is that, um, you know, again, so it's not a binary choice, this or that, right? Like I've kind of made very clearly like that. If there, if it was binary, I've definitely made that decision, right? Moving out to, to land 32 acres and, you know, um, you know, working more, learning to work more with my hands. I'm reading a great book right now, by the way, called Durable Trades. Talks all about the kind of the history of, uh, you know, jobs, you know, and kind of just making the prediction that, um, you know, jobs to be knowing how to grow things, grow your food, raise your food, fix things, build things. Um, that those are skills that will never, ever go away. They're, they're not going to be automated to the extent um, that so many other things are at risk of. Anyways, so the point is, like, if just people got these questions, ask themselves, like, um, and so, again, I don't think it's binary, um, but I do think, you know, um, that people have got to make some of these real decisions. And when it comes back to their life and it comes back to leadership, right, you can get more and more efficient, for sure, in many cases, by bringing on more technology or more AI, more machine learning, um, you know, and there's just real questions I think that people have to ask of like automating, uh, people checking me out at the grocery store, right? Well, guess what? You still have to have a human being there to be able to, to look at, you know, your ID if you're trying to buy alcohol. And when the stupid machine that you're trying to you know, tells you that you're putting too many items in the bag too fast, right? You still need human beings in, in the ecosystem, right? right? Um, and those are real people who have jobs and have purpose from coming there and checking in people out at the grocery store and stocking shelves. You know, and so there's a bit of a, uh, I won't say a moral and an ethical question here, but as we look at, you know, uh, truck drivers and we look at all these professions of people like, like the future of self-driving cars, like there's real questions we have to ask ourselves, you know, about what is the purpose of relationships? What is the purpose of human connection in the workforce? And just because something is more efficient, does that mean it's the right thing to do? Or does that mean it's the best thing to do for that person or, or more largely for society. And look, I'm for capitalism. I think it's great that, you know, people move in the direction of, of what's going to allow them to be as successful and as efficient as possible as a business and as a company, as a nonprofit. Um, but I think we've got to ask ourselves some of these questions around, you know, are we, are we willing to, um, you know, lean in on the human factor, humanity, because ultimately at the end of the day, like that's what separates us from machines. You know, and, and that's the separates from, you know, from things that, that don't have a heartbeat, you know, like that's mm -hmm. us. And so if that's our competitive advantage against machines, we got to tap into that to the very best of our ability. And this book really just highlights, you know, the need specifically for leaders to do that. Like you said, recognizing that tyranny of distance by building meaningful relationships. And it, those questions you just asked are something we have to answer internally. It's for us to, th those are the questions that we ask one another. And yeah, so that we can all right. move forward together and continue to find fulfillment and purpose in our life. Mike sure. Irwin, talk about, I mean, talk about being better than yesterday, forming meaningful, yeah. purposeful relationships. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I appreciate it. Great, great. As always, to connect, Tony, and appreciate the chance to really unpack some of these big, I mean, these are some big, heavy, philosophical conversations, right? Like, and, and my hope is I'm trying to have as many uh, discussions with people as possible about them, right? And, and priming them and pushing them to ask more of these questions and to think more about this stuff because I don't want to see us 10 years down the road from now, um, kind of like we do now, looking at, geez, like the world has changed drastically and everyone's walking around and, and not leaving their couch because they got their VR headset on, you know, and well, why go to the game? You can just watch it and feel like you're at the game by never leaving your couch, you know? Right. Um, I think we've got to really, you know, ask ourselves some of those uncomfortable questions of how do I want my life to look in a decade, you know? Um, and again, it does absolutely apply directly to leadership, uh, certainly, but it's really more broadly because that definition of leadership we deploy, you know, is really a, about more than just like, you know, am I a manager and work or not? Uh, it applies to everyone's life. So I appreciate the chance to connect. Absolutely. And if people want to connect with you, where are they going? Yeah, so, you know, simple enough. You can find it you know, on, on uh, LinkedIn, Irwin RWB on Twitter and, and Instagram, um, and wherever you're posting this and sharing it, I'll be jumping in there into the conversation so people can probably find me there. Absolutely. And you can also pick up the book, Leadership is a Relationship. Mike, thank yes, you again. Sir. And as always, thanks for having our six.
That's right. Appreciate it, Tony. Thanks a lot. I don't know what you've been told, Sixers, but the lawyers would like us to remind you that the views, opinions, and comments expressed on the Got Your Six podcast are solely those of the hosts or guests to include current and previous Department of Defense employees and should in no way be considered the opinions of or endorsements on behalf of the Department of Defense or any of its components, divisions, contractors, or other current and previous staff members.